You're listening to KCBS In-Depth. We need, and we haven't done this yet, to centralize our public health system. The people, places, and issues the Bay Area is talking about. We have done exactly what needed to be done, which is provide and give an effective vaccine. The key for gun safety reform advocates is to think about this in the long term. These times when change happen, often brief, so you want to get as much accomplished as possible. This is KCBS In-Depth. California has been facing one punishing wildfire season after another, and this year seems to be no different as massive blazes scorch hundreds of thousands of acres up and down the state. But of course, this string of disasters isn't just a run of bad luck. Welcome to KCBS In Depth, I'm Keith Menconi, and today on the program, we'll be examining the crisis behind the crisis, that is, climate change which has supercharged California's wildfires by warming the state up, drying it out, and priming it to burn. Guiding us through the latest in climate and wildfire science, our guest today will be Patrick Brown, a professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University and part of the school's new Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center, founded last year to draw together experts from several different fields. We'll be hearing a little bit later on about some of the work they've been cooking up. Here is that conversation. Patrick Brown, welcome to KCBS In-Depth. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So it seems like every year we are somewhat aghast at the the pace of change, whether it's the the aridification of California, how quickly things are drying out, or whether we're talking about how much things are getting hotter or how much earlier uh, the summer season is beginning and how much longer the wildfire season is becoming. But as somebody who has been studying the patterns of climate change and looking at the really long-term trajectory of all of this, what does the season look like to you? Is this in line with what we should be expecting, you know, with the the, the massive jump in temperatures that we've seen throughout much of the West and uh, so many records breaking? Uh, breaking? Is this surprising for you or is this about in line with what you would expect to see on the broad trajectory of climate change that we've been on for so many years now? Uh, yeah, in terms of wildfire activity, this is you know right in line with the long-term trends that we've been seeing uh, since the middle of of the 20th century, where essentially uh, you know since kind of global warming really really took over uh, the planetary signal, uh, we've seen uh, increases in temperature basically globally, and that has uh, been the case here in California as well, and in California and in the West in general. As temperatures increase, that essentially means drying, and it means drying of our vegetation and of the fuels that are available for uh, wildfires. And as fuels get drier, wildfires can become more intense, and you can uh, ignite more wildfires. And so it was a very early prediction in climate science that we would see more wildfires in the West and in California as it got warmer. And it's always more powerful when uh, you actually make a prediction in, in science and the prediction comes true. That's a lot more uh, powerful than, you know, retrospectively uh, trying to come up with an explanation. And so this is one of these predictions that unfortunately has come true. And it is uh, essentially in line with, um, with, with exactly what we would expect physically from it getting uh, warmer and drier. I mean, last year we did see more acres burned than at any in any previous fire season that we've recorded in California, and we may be on pace to outdo that in the fire season ahead. We've already seen more acres burned now than were burned at the same time last year. So is that just in line with this slow creeping up of fire intensity and, and uh, wildfire reach? Yeah, so every single year, you know, incrementally as it gets warmer, we expect it to get drier and we expect, um, you know, in the long term, uh, it to be more conducive for fires. But there's still, you know, plenty of year to year variability, uh, which in, in terms of fire activity, which would be affected by a lot of things. Uh, so, for example, last year, we had this uh, lightning storm in the, in the middle of August, which accounted for more than half of the area burned in 2020. And so assuming we don't get a similar event like that this year, then you know we can expect uh, much less area burned in 2021, even under the same climate conditions. So there's still plenty of year-to-year variability. It's, it's not like we expect you know, every year to be worse than the previous year, um, but in the long-term, we are seeing this just uh, long-term trend of kind of 
it being more and more conducive to wildfires so that when you do have ignitions, you're more likely to get uh, larger fires that are that are harder to control. Speaking with Patrick Brown with San Jose State's Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. Now, talking about the drought in particular, we do know that climate change affects rainfall in sometimes surprising ways. We'll see long years of drought and then we'll see torrential uh, rainfall all at once. Uh, So just it's a more complex relationship than simply saying when it gets hotter, we will always have less rain. Uh, How should we think about this current drought and its relationship to climate change? How is that working? Yeah, so that is a much more uh, kind of controversial and uncertain area of the science than temperature and aridity. Uh, So we actually, you know, we don't really see long-term trends in precipitation in California and climate models don't project really a change in total precipitation uh, in California. So Mm. drought from the perspective of precipitation is not necessarily expected um, to change uh, due to uh, global warming. Now, there are some nuances to that where climate models do in fact project that we should see a sharpening of the of the rainy season, meaning that we maybe get the same amount of rain over the entire year, but that's concentrated more in those uh, winter months. So kind of more in December, January, February, and less uh, spread out throughout the year. And so what that would mean is that you would have you know still sufficient moisture to kind of build up fuels uh, for wildfires, but then a longer dry season, so then a longer fire season. Uh, and so those two things could kind of work together to, to still uh, enhance the fire season or enhance fire activity during uh, fire season. But it's, yeah, in terms of the drought, it's really more, you know, thinking about that as it gets warmer, you can have more evaporation out of reservoirs and, and out of the soil. And so that aspect of, of the hydrological cycle, the evaporation out of the surface is really what's, uh, what climate change dominates rather than uh, the precipitation you know, going into the surface, into the reservoirs. And the extremely low snowpack that we've seen this year as well, does that have any relationship to climate change? Yeah, I mean, to the extent that it's due to reduced precipitation, not necessarily, but uh, when you're talking about the snowpack melting earlier, then yes, you know, as it gets warmer, then you have a smaller amount of time during the year when you're below freezing. And so you have um, a longer amount of time where you where you don't have a uh, snowpack. And the timing here really matters because uh, a month of extra fire season on both ends uh, may not seem like a ton of extra time, but we're t- when we're talking about uh, the fall, that is pushing it into uh, the September-October range when we are seeing the Santa Ana winds in Southern California and the Diablo winds in Northern California, and those fast winds make for much faster-moving wildfires that are more difficult for uh, firefighters to deal with. Yeah, exactly. You know, the, the campfires is a great example of that, of a uh, late-season uh, you know, extremely impactful fire that occurred during one of these downslope windstorms. And uh, that's absolutely the case that if it, if it rains in September or October, and so then our fuels are no longer at these critically dry uh, thresholds or below these thresholds, then it doesn't matter how many downslope windstorms you have. They're not going to be uh, causing power lines to, to go out and they're not going to be spreading fires. Uh, so it's it's the combination of if that first rainfall or, you know, those first couple rainfalls get pushed into December, uh, then you're going to have these these downslope windstorms in October and November uh, during a time period when your fuels are very dry. And so then that's a huge concern for those uh, very impactful wildfires. I'm just going to reintroduce you again real quick. Uh, we are once again speaking with Patrick Brown, a professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University. He's part of the school's new Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. Uh, I'm Keith Menconi. This is KCBS In-Depth, and we're talking right now about the relationship between California's worsening wildfire season and climate change. So digging into that uh, a little bit more, I'm sure this is a question that you've been asked a lot in, in recent years, uh, given some of the controversial things that have come out of former President Donald Trump's mouth. But uh, open question in a lot of people's minds, to what extent are California's bad wildfires a product of climate change? And to what extent is it a matter of the fuel management in the state, the fact that we've been suppressing fires for so long, and uh, we've seen such a buildup of fuel over the last 100 plus years? 
Uh, how do you think about that? And how, how, how should we think about that? Uh, is climate change most of the story, half of the story, or is there a better way to think of it? Uh, so if I had to pick, I would say it's it's around half. Uh, mm. And, you know, we can kind of get at that from from statistics of just looking at years when it happens to be much warmer than usual and years that it happens to be colder than usual. We call that a natural experiment. So not necessarily looking at the long term trend, but just these these random uh, warm and, and cold years. We can see that that variability in temperature uh, basically controls the variability in area burns uh, about 40% um, of the of the variability in area burned is is explained by that variability in temperature and so um, that leaves you know 60% of the variability unexplained uh, by temperature and so that's you know a lot of things it's randomness in terms of uh, ignitions you know whether or not there happens to be a a gender reveal party that uh, causes a fire or whether or not there happens to be a, a lightning storm in a given location. And then a lot of the rest of the variability we do think is due to this, you know, century of fire suppression, which has caused uh, an unnatural buildup of fuels. And, you know, what, what gets called a fire deficit in a lot of locations where in the natural state or in the state when uh, indigenous people were burning uh, the land intentionally, you had a situation where you had a uh, high frequency of low intensity fires. And now, you know, because of this policy of fire suppression for a century, you have a buildup of fuels. And so then when you do have fires, uh, they're much more intense, they're much more severe. Uh, and they, you know, this is coinciding with, with the situation where the fuels are drying as well. And so you have this uh, confluence of factors causing the wildfire crisis in the West. So fair to say that we would be in a bad situation with uh, either one of these factors, but together they're kind of multipliers? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So then, given all that, what should we expect in the years ahead? Is this a problem that, uh, as we've seen in this year and the year past, uh, wildfires just uh, growing little by little each year? Uh, Or should we expect more peaks and valleys? What's the trend that uh, folks should expect? Yeah, so any given year is going to be very difficult uh, to predict. So 2019, roughly the same climate as 2020 and 2021, but 2019 was a very low year in terms of area burned, you know, something like 250,000 uh, acres compared to you know, 4.5 million acres in, in 2020. So those are essentially the same climate, huge difference in, in area burn. So you're going to have uh, year-to-year variability. But as the climate gets warmer and, and as it continues to get drier, we expect uh, the climate change portion of that signal to only exacerbate uh, wildfires. And the unfortunate part with climate change is that for the next several decades, that is baked in, like that is uh, locked in. So hmm. regardless of you know, international policy, uh, you know, the most ambitious international policy would, would try to get uh, global emissions down to zero uh, later, you know, in the latter half of the of the 21st century, and emissions need to be close to zero in order for temperature to stop rising, not for temperature to go back down to where it was previously, but for it to stop rising. And so we don't expect temperatures to stop rising um, at a minimum um, before the end of, of this century, essentially. So any type of solution to this problem would have to do more with uh, forest management, or uh, other things that people are doing, you know, on the ground here in, in terms of uh, reducing ignitions, but probably, you know, mostly uh, through forest management, either controlled uh, burns, prescribed burns, or mechanical thinning of, of forests. And so given all that, what, what, how should that inform our ongoing debates about what to do about wildfire. Of course, there is the huge debate about how much we should put towards suppressing wildfire, how much we should be putting towards the fire lines, and on the other hand, how much we should be putting towards controlled burns and and fuels management. And uh, all of these things are uh, pretty difficult in their own right. But then, as we're discussing, of course, right now, there's this overarching issue of uh, climate change. And since it is something that even in the best case scenario is kind of on a set track for the next 80 years, is that something that can really impact the way that we think about our response to wildfires in the here and now? It's a great question. And I don't know if I have a good answer. Uh, you know, for mm. in terms of climate policy, that's something that we all have to do collectively uh, globally because we share the same atmosphere and CO2 is this well-mixed greenhouse gas that goes uh, everywhere. So, uh, you know, China's emissions and India's emissions 
uh, affect the globe the same as the U.S. Uh, emissions do. So they affect our wildfires the same way that our local uh, emissions in California do. So that's very different than the air pollution uh, issue, for example, in, in Los Angeles or, or anywhere locally where you can reduce emissions locally and see that effect locally. And so that's in some ways that makes that a much easier problem to solve because you can motivate people, you know, locally in the, in the here and now. Uh, so that climate, you know, the climate change uh, issue is, is one of these very thorny uh, issues in terms of, in terms of policy. And so, uh, you know, we hope that that's solved at the global level and at the, you know, decade uh, scale this century. Uh, but in terms of wildfires, that, that has to be a much more local uh, you know, tackling that locally. And of course, that's very thorny as well. Of like, how do you uh, deal with if you're going to do prescribed burns, that's going to lower air quality in various locations. And I'm sure there'll be uh, many fights about that. But I don't I don't have a good answer for how exactly that should be done. Well, I think uh, just about everybody's looking for a good answer at the moment. Um, once again, speaking with Patrick Brown with San Jose State University's Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. Uh, I actually want to go back to some of the points that you were making a little bit earlier in terms of how much of the wildfires that we're seeing right now should be attributed to the the uh, poor fuel management question, just how, how much uh, plant vegetation growth we've seen uh, versus climate change. And you, you were actually giving some uh, figures right there. Uh, found that pretty interesting. This speaks to something that I think is always pretty difficult in climate science, which is uh, attribution. How do we say how much of this climate phenomena is uh, due to long-term climate change? How much of this weather pattern is due to long-term climate change? How how do we know what we know? I guess is what I'm trying to get at. What how do we how can we put uh, those concrete numbers on it? And and why does it seem uh, like we know more as time goes on about the role of climate change in uh, wildfire activity? Yeah. So the uh, the statistic I mentioned earlier was just kind of this simple um, statistic of looking at how much association there is between year to year temperature variability and uh, and area burned. And so that's what we call a natural experiment um, where uh, we can just kind of use uh, empirical methods to statistically estimate uh, the relationship between two things. Um, but we prefer as climate scientists to use uh, physical laws uh, to understand the relationship between two things, because then it, it's not going to come about by some statistical coincidence. You know that it's based on some on physical reality. And so that, in that way of looking at things, we use climate models. Uh, so climate models uh, are not statistical models the way that you know economic models often are. They are physical models. They're based on physics. And so what you can do with climate models is you can um, say, you know, what would the world look like if we had not increased uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? And the model will use physics, physical laws, to calculate what the what the world would look like. Uh, and so that's how we that's how we get at that um, those relationships and uh, anchor them to our knowledge of physics. Hmm. And I, I know that refining those models is pretty central to your own work. Uh, projecting into the future, then, do we have a sense of how much worse uh, wildfires are expected to get in California? I mean, from a really historical perspective, uh, we're still, I believe, not burning as many acres as we were burned. Uh, Pre uh, uh, before Western settlers arrived in California, uh, so you know there, there's obviously a lot more that could burn. Um, how much more should we expect to burn in the future? It's a very difficult question to answer because actually the models have projected a much smaller increase than what we've actually seen, uh, and so then that that's one of these interesting. That seems unnerving. Yeah, right. So that's one of these interesting uh, things in science is that then multiple explanations can come about. So one explanation could be, oh, the models are far, they're not sensitive enough in terms of the, uh, you know, wildfire reaction to temperature change. And so they need to be refined to be more sensitive. So then if you did that, then you would essentially be projecting a lot more uh, increases in wildfire in the future. Uh, another explanation would be that, well, the models, you know, are not really properly accounting for this uh, buildup of fuels from, uh, from the century of, of fire suppression. And so if that's the case, then, you know, treating forests um, in terms of uh, mechanical thinning and prescribed burning 
uh, could then solve the problem and get us, or not solve the problem, but get us back down closer to what the models project, you know, should be the long-term uh, trajectory. So I think it's very much an open question. Uh, I don't really know what the, um, what the area burns plot, you know, for California will look like over the next several decades. I think that's much more uncertain than a lot of other things. Like for, for global temperature, for example, like that's kind of locked in. And uh, for precipitation patterns in a lot of locations, like we have high uh, confidence in, in a lot of those things. But this is one of those things that we have, you know, lower confidence in. And there's, um, there's a variety of pathways that it could take, especially depending on how people are managing uh, forests and managing uh, ignitions at the local level. But just to, just to put a fine point on it, it seems like you were suggesting a moment ago that the predictions for uh, wildfire growth in California, uh, the, the models were predicting, you know, pretty bad increases, but the path that we're on right now is even worse. Yeah, much worse. So if you if you look at, you know, California's fourth climate change assessment, um, they have projections uh, going into the future, which uh, never have a year like 2020, uh, even at the end of the century. Uh, so when you kind of put what's been observed on top of the projections, the, the observations kind of go off the chart uh, very early on. Uh, and so that's uh, something that that obviously needs to be uh, refined in terms of um, in terms of projections into the future and, and refining our modeling. All right. Uh, so a lot more to be looked at right there. I'm going to reintroduce you one more time. We are speaking right now to Patrick Brown, professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University. And he's a part of the school's new Wildfire Inter Interdisciplinary Research Center. This is KCBS In-Depth. I'm Keith Menconi. And I actually want to talk about that Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center, which uh, joined the university last year. Uh, em emphasis on the interdisciplinary, because it is bringing together a lot of different kinds of scientists with a lot of different technical expertise. And uh, curious to hear your thoughts on why that's important when it comes to climate science. Uh, wh why do you need so many mm, different uh, cooks in the kitchen to really get a handle on the big questions of climate change and wildfire? Yeah, so a lot of climate scientists, uh, you know, study climate science from a very just, you know, physical perspective, you know, wondering why uh, the atmosphere acts the way that it does or precipitation patterns act the way that it does. But most, you know, regular people are interested in climate science in terms of how it will how the cli how climate change will impact people and so human and ecosystem uh, human societies and ecosystems and wildfire is just an example of a very high impact phenomenon that's being you know affected by climate change and is um, impacting us here on the ground and so when you're talking about something like that you want um, more than just physical scientists right you want people that are interested in how uh, humans react to wildfires for example react to and cause wildfires so we have in the center we have social scientists we have uh, in the center we have environmental scientists so looking more at the ecology of wildfires uh, we have um, people in engineering we have people in meteorology we have you know people like me that are looking at uh, climate, so lo longer time scales, larger spatial scales, where the meteorologists are often looking at fires at the level of, you know, minutes to hours, how they behave, why they might go down one canyon and not another canyon, how they create their own weather, which can drive uh, how they spread and understanding that can uh, better inform uh, how to fight wildfires and how to predict them on the, you know, on the scale of today, what is this fire going to do and where should we put our fire lines and where should we uh, deploy our resources. So looking at it from all of these perspectives, um, we think brings the most value in terms of, you know, actually impacting, you know, how we, um, how we, how we best react to wildfires when they do occur and how we minimize their impacts. I find this pretty interesting because it brings to mind for me the suggestions that uh, I've been hearing from a number of climate scientists in re recent years that what what we're really talking about when we talk about climate change is quite a bit bigger than those two words suggest. We're talking about changes throughout society, throughout the ecosystem, throughout the planet that are, are going to impact 
so many aspects of our life, you know, whether we're talking about uh, how hot cities get and the, the health impacts on people or, or whether we talk about uh, how forests are, are working and, and how, wild, how much wildfires are, are, are burning them up. I mean, there's just so many things that are tied into the questions of climate change. And uh, as uh, you're, you're talking about right there, you, you do need that multidisciplinary approach to uh, tackle some of those uh, questions. Um, uh, what for you um, is are some of the big questions that you th- you're excited to be uh, tackling uh, as a part of this new interdisciplinary research center at San Jose State? So I think uh, one of the one of the big things that we want to understand is the spatial distribution of how uh, wildfire risk will change. Uh, so you know I'm interested in in how we can best deploy resources to minimize uh, the risk of wildfires. And so looking at how, uh, what are the main drivers of wildfire influence in terms of the environmental variables that influence wildfires the most, if we can pinpoint those, then we can project how those will change in the future and understand how uh, wildfire risk changes at a very high spatial resolution going forward into the future. And so then you can, that can help, you know, inform decisions about where infrastructure uh, should or should not be uh, incentivized to be built, Um, you know, where we should prioritize burying power lines, um, things like that. So trying to um, get that information will hopefully help, uh, you know, actually help people uh, in the coming decades in terms of reducing risk of wildfires. Just uh, brings to mind, a, I suppose, a little off-kilter question. I mean, is it is this a good time to be a climate scientist studying fires, or is it kind of an upsetting time to be a climate scientist studying wildfires? Well, I think it's both. I mean, I think it's always, uh, you always want your work to be uh, valuable, but of course, uh, it's it's very disconcerting when you're studying things that are negatively impacting people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, we do thank you for joining the program and for the research that you're doing and uh, look forward to a lot of the big uh, answers that we expect to come out of that research. We have been speaking once again to Patrick Brown, a professor of meteorology and climate science at San Jose State University. And once again, he's a part of the new Wildfire Interdisciplinary Research Center. Patrick Brown, thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you all for listening. For KCBS and In-Depth, I'm Keith Menconi. Stay safe, be well. We'll see you next week. You've been listening to KCBS In-Depth. Get every episode by subscribing on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and other podcast platforms. Visit kcbsradio.com for more news and interviews. We are the Bay Area's news station, KCBS.